Consume me, Lord. And no, we weren't saying, you can sue me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh. Praise God. God is good. Oh, Jesus. He gives us a sense of humor, you know. <laughs> Some have more, more blessing in that area. Praise God. <laughs> God, you are so good all the time. And all the time, his mercy endures forever. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Saints of God, let's worship the Lord. Hey, God is good all the time. God is Good. 
receive. The disciples once asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray the way John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. And what did they say? Oh, Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign. And you will never change. Yeah! 
A joy to be with you. A joy to bring the word to you. We're in the epistle of First John today, First John chapter 2. We'll be starting at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is in the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. That's a big chunk of text. What does it have to do with thanksgiving? Well, I was pondering what I might bring on thanksgiving. It could be a text about thanksgiving and so forth. There are plenty of those. But it occurs to me it might be more helpful to, uh, to share with you scriptures focusing on the thing for which I am in many respects most thankful. Jesus first, and then you. The body of Christ. The entirety of 1 John is about the fellowship of believers one with another. And this portion right in the middle has to do with something very important that we don't talk about very much. How in the world do we distinguish between true Christians and false ones? Because there are a great many. This is true of every church. It's not a denominational thing. More true of some churches than others, albeit. But if you pick any congregation at random, you're going to find people there perhaps who've attended for many years, maybe held membership for decades, who in fact don't know Jesus. They're fakers, but they're good at it. Because what it is to be a follower of Christ is mainly not external, it's internal. Jesus changes a person on the inside. This has outward consequences. But there are people who can fake the outside stuff, at least in public. And so today we're going to take a bite of a very big passage, but it's an important one. It has three pericopes in it, that is three separate um, subjects within the single text, but they all flow together, and so we're going to look at all of them. The first pericope, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The term world can be used many different ways, at least 14 different ways in the New Testament. For example, sometimes it can refer to uh, the, uh, the planet. Sometimes it can refer to everyone in the world whom God will not save. That is, those who will never come to faith in Christ. Sometimes, as in this uh, case, it can refer to worldliness, the world system, the fallen system. And there are even times, like, for example, John 3.16, where world can refer to those to whom God 
has extended grace and will save, who will come to saving faith. But here we're talking about worldliness, the world system. If anyone loves this world, the word, by the way, um, the word for love here is agape. It's the same word that's applied um, to loving God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That love. Love your neighbors yourself. Same love. Um, love your enemies. Same love. Husbands, love your wives. Same love. So it's possible to misuse agape. Agape is a mode of behavior. It is not an emotion. It treats the other lovingly, irrespective of how one feels. So in this case, we are not to treat the world lovingly. We are not to love this world behaviorally. We're not to treat something that God considers to be worthless and disposable as though it were not. Just in case anybody hears into the whole climate crisis thing. Just saying. And anyone who loves the world does not have the love of the Father at all. That means you're not saved. Because if you haven't received the love of the Father, you haven't been changed in Christ, yes? So, this is serious. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, that can also be translated pride of your possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. That's not to say the possessions are a bad thing, just don't love them. And it's not to say that you shouldn't work hard for your family and seek to put a roof over their heads and a decent vehicle in the driveway and good food on the table. This is Thanksgiving after all. We're cooking a turkey, I don't know about you. But it is to say we are not to take pride in any of it. We recognize that all of it is a gift from God. He gave it to me. He could take it away tomorrow. I could walk out of here broke. It doesn't matter at all because that doesn't do anything to change my status with God. I am a completely redeemed child of the living God, and one day he's going to show me how much he loves me by killing me and taking me to heaven. Nobody goes early. Every day given us has been written in his book before even one took place. So, all of the, the and not to overstate it, but pride is a sin. It's a sin. I, I, I know, I know, there's a sense in which we can use the term pride to describe a good thing, like, boy, girl, I, 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 I'm proud of you for that thing you did, or son, well done, running the race and finishing the thing. That was great. We're proud of you. That's not what this is about. This is talking about the internal, self-aggrandizing delight one takes in one's own accomplishments and accumulations. Don't ever do that because that's never from God. And the world is passing away along with its desires. That word desires, I'm reading from the ESV, is epithumia. It means lusts. Lust is a categorical sin. Allow me to explain. Everything in the Bible that is a sin can be put in one of two columns. Either a categorical sin, that which is always sinful, no matter what, no matter who, no matter when, no matter why, and that which is contextually sinful. That is to say, it's a morally neutral thing that could be used sinfully. Yes? Epithumia. These desires are categorically bad. All the time, no matter what. And they come in two varieties. There's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Internal to you is a sinful nature. As long as you occupy this mortal body, you're going to have one. That nature is capable of desiring what God does not want you to desire. Those are the lusts of the flesh. Then there are things that are external to you that can push your buttons, grab your attention. And, uh, for example, in Matthew 5, 28, uh, a man looks upon a woman lustfully. Yes, he's committed adultery with her in his heart. An external lust trigger. So, both are a problem. If we put you in a solit sol solitary confinement on the moon, you'd still have the lust of the flesh with you. I'm perfectly capable of falling into it. Then we shift to the second pericope, children. Uh, John often refers to these folks as his children, not because they were biologically speaking, but because he was really, really old. This was written just about five years before he died, and they were our age, and a lot of them had come to Christ through his ministry. So they were his spiritual children, if you will. This is an affectional term. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have 
Come, therefore, we know that it is the last hour. The last hour meaning what exactly? That phrase and others like it is used in two very distinct ways in the New Testament. It can be used to describe the moment in time before Jesus comes back. But it can also be used, as in this case, to describe the period of time from Christ's departure to his eventual return. We are in the last hour. Remember, John spoke this 2,000 years ago, and he said, then it is the last hour. It is the last hour. It is the period of time after Christ's departure and before his return, and Antichrist is coming. Antichrist, capital A, refers to a man who is going to rise at the end of time, right before Jesus returns, and essentially take over the world. He's going to do this because God will allow him to. If you don't understand how that works, you need to read the book of Job. And he, the Antichrist, capital A, will be possessed by Satan and will have profound power and will be allowed to do all kinds of destructive things, but that's not what John's talking about. You've heard about the Antichrist coming? You heard about that? Well, guess what? There are many Antichrists, and they're here now. To what is he referring? Not simply to non-believers, although Antichrists are non-believers. He's referring to a very particular kind of non-believer. We know that from verse 19. He's referring to pseudo adelphoi false brethren. And he describes them this way. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Or if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain, or more literally, it might be shown that they all are not of us, not one of them. How do we know that we're in this time period called the last hour? There are antichrists. Where are they? Here. Amongst the body. But they eventually identify themselves in an environment where Christians, and it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter about brand. We're not talking denomination here. That's not an issue. If you're born from above, if you're bo born from above, born of God and born again are synonyms. Okay? You'll see all of them through this text. John loves using it. If you're born from above, you belong to Jesus, you will be driven to holiness. If you're driven to holiness, along with everybody else in the room, those who do not in fact know the Lord, but have kind of been hanging on, are going to get annoyed because they are of the devil. They are here to poison and to deceive and to misinstruct. Ah, misinformation. Boy, oh boy. Hear that one get thrown a lot in the call. It's interesting how very often in our culture, the terms misinformation and disinformation are being thrown around by antichrists. Have you noticed that? So don't get it in your head that just because your neighbor next door who doesn't know Jesus, um, doesn't know Jesus, that he's going to be an antichrist. N no. But if you're dealing with someone who's pretending to be a Christian and isn't, or is a syncretist, that is to say, has adopted... Um, Christianity to a certain extent, but he's also into that religion and this one, and he sort of, sort of stirs them all into a big pot. Antichrist. Be careful. Verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I'm not going to dwell on this. It, it, it's a little pet peeve, okay? I'm a biblical exegete. It's a little pet peeve, so take it for what it is. I really love you. But from time to time, one of you will come up to me and say something that's mildly dumb, like, I need a fresh anointing. To which I would say, uh, what's wrong with the old one? You are anointed. You have, past tense, received anointing from God. He has filled you with his spirit. Your, his spirit indwells you. There's the anointing. And he has imparted to you knowledge of himself. That's the knowledge being referred to here. Virtually always in 1 John, when you see knowledge, we're talking about the knowledge of God. Okay? That's already established in chapter 1. Which means every single person who is in Christ can say truthfully, I know God. And in fact, just in case, just in case you're visiting with us and perhaps are 
considering whether or not you want to become a disciple of Christ, you will periodically hear Christians say or ask, uh, do you know the Lord? That's what we mean. So, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is in the truth. Who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And here's the point. If we had a cult member visiting today who comes from a really whacked out church, but he's packing a Bible, and it looks like your Bible and my Bible, and he's naming the name of Jesus, and he likes the songs, and he's clapping his hands, smiling as white as a goat. How, how, can, you, how can you tell whether or not he's, he's really in Christ? Ask him about Jesus. You're a follower of the Lord. Great. Who's that? If you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, eventually he's going to get around to, well, Jesus is basically a manifestation of the archangel Michael. And uh, he's, not, he's not God in the sense of God, God. He's just he's lower created, created being, yes. And, oh, so you don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible, who is king of everything, creator of all, Lord of all, master, God, the Son, yes? Or if you run into a Mormon, say, who believes that Jesus is a God, but not the God, hit the buzzer, you're done. So, who is the liar? He who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Christ, Christos, is the Greek word for the Hebrew Mashiach, Messiah. Yes, the anointed one of God. Anointed one. Don't miss that. We're anointed because he's anointed and he's passed anointing to us. The Holy One gave it to us. You follow the logic? And anybody who denies that Jesus is the Christ is antichristic by nature. He's a liar. He's not just mistaken. This isn't an oopsie. Pause button. If I seem to be getting wound up, you have to understand, pastor means shepherd. Shepherds protect sheep. It's what we do. And one of the ways we do that is by teaching you this stuff so you can see a wolf. Eh? <laughs> no one, verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This goes back to John uh, 14, 6, right? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The mercies of God are infinitely deep, but profoundly narrow. Deep, but narrow. It is through the Son, and only the Son. There are no exceptions. And if you have Jesus, you have it all. You have the Father. You have the impartation of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you and anoints you, has anointed you, has given you knowledge of God. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. This is not a new gospel. This is the same old, same old, the story of the cross. Yes, repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ stuff. That message that you heard from the beginning, you need to continue in it. If that message abides in you, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will, not might, will abide In the Lord. The gospel is not something we start out with and then move on to bigger things when we become mature. The message about who Jesus is and what he has done is the thing that saves you, is the thing that strengthens you, is the thing that teaches you, is the thing that guards you, is the thing that makes you strong, makes you mature, makes you able to teach others. It's the gospel. You never outgrow your need for the gospel. Never. Which means when you're running into... Tough times, tough days. And you're just feeling like your gas tanks run dry, spiritually speaking. You're not looking for a new experience. Okay? Don't, don't go there. Lord, I need a tank up. No, you don't. You need to preach the gospel to yourself. You need to go back to the beginning. Okay, Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of the living God and creator of all things. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's God, and He's my God, and He died on the tree for me. 
and he's taken my sins from me. I bear no guilt before God on account of what Jesus has done. Start there. And watch what, watch what happens. Watch what happens to your heart and to your anxiety. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, I think. Yeah, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thanksgiving to God, not just to anybody. Thanksgiving to God is the antidote for anxiety. You feeling anxious? Start praising God. Start thanking Him. Just make a list. Start thanking Him. Okay? Pushing on. Or I'll be here all day because I do that. 25. And this is the promise that He made to us. Eternal life. The promise. That word, to a Jewish audience especially, was extremely significant. Promise is the Old Testament vernacular for gospel. The good news of the New Testament, the promise of the Old Testament, specifically the promise of a coming Messiah who will pay for your sins. Yes? In fact, Christians are, in Romans 9, 7-ish, referred to as children of the promise. It's another name for us. And what is this promise? What's the end game of this promise? Eternal life. If you're in Christ, you can not die spiritually. You have been made alive in Him. Every human being, there are no exceptions, is comprised of three components. Body, soul, spirit. My body is what you see standing up here. It is dead. And it is going to die, and there's nothing you can do about it. The only thing that will stop this body from dying is if Jesus comes back first. It needs to die, because this body is corrupt with sin. Then there's my soul, thoughts, feelings, personality, and will. That's the me that you know, the personality within, yes? And then there's my spirit also translatable as ghost. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, same diff. Yes? My spirit is the non-corporeal me that goes on forever and ever and ever. It either goes on forever and ever and ever with God in heaven or apart from God in hell. But it's going on either way. And anyone who is in Christ has been born again, that's what it means. You've had your dead human spirit removed and replaced with a new living spirit in Christ, your hard heart removed and a soft faith-filled, repentant heart given, such that you now love God and hate sin ever increasingly with time. That's the promise, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So Antichrist, seek to deceive, that's important. But if the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. One has to make distinction in the scriptures between descriptive language and prescriptive language. And verses like this are sometimes taken to be prescriptive. Okay, right, Jesus saved me, that's, that's great. Now I have to keep myself in him. So you have to keep myself in him or I'm going to be unsaved again and dead. And that's not what it's saying at all. This is a descriptive text, as we'll see in a moment. It's descriptive because you're not the one who keeps you. He is by his anointing. This describes what a genuinely saved person looks like. A genuinely saved person will not leave Jesus. Unlike, you'll note, the Antichrist. The antichristic ones. Every once in a while... This has happened in the middle of services, you know. I, I tried to ignore them, but they, they'll just get up and leave right in the middle of the service because it said something and it read something and it just cheeses them off. We, we usually smile and wish them well and hold the door. Now, just because somebody leaves the church does not mean that person is an antichrist. It's perfectly valid and reasonable to leave the church for a lot of other reasons. Maybe somebody got sick, maybe they moved, maybe they decided they would fellowship at another church. That's okay. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about fake Christians who, when presented with this gospel, turn red in the face, get really stinking mad. To which we say, sayonara. But the anointing that you received from him 
abides in you and you have no need that anyone should teach you. What does that mean? It means that you can pick up the Bible and teach yourself. One of the sweetest things I've seen with new, new believers, I'm not going to point any fingers, There's, some of them are sitting in this room, brand new Christians, and, and they, they sit down with me sometime, maybe in a Bible study or something, and there's glowing, glowing happiness. Like, what, what's been going on in your life this week? I read five books of the Bible, man. I, just, I just read it. I just sat down and I couldn't stop and I just stuffed it into my brain and it's incredible. And what does this mean, by the way? Okay, I love it. I'm a Bible teacher. I got to tell you, keep it up. You can teach yourself. That's the whole, you put a baby in a high chair, okay, high chair, to feed him in the hopes that he'll learn to feed himself. And if he's three years old and he's not feeding himself yet, something's wrong. So, now little children, verse 28, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. And this is the challenge. Why, why would John preach this to a group of people who all claim to be Christians? Because he knows some of them aren't. And it's the ones who commit to abiding, who prove thereby they got the Spirit of God living in them. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't do it. You'll never do it. Anyone who is honest about his own heart recognizes we really suck. We're terrible. We are so drenched in sin, so prone to disobedience. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Without the Spirit of the living God holding you, by his anointing, you'll notice, you've had it. And so this is a warning to those who are sitting in the congregation and thinking, okay, everyone... Everyone believes I'm doing pretty good, but I know full well my life is full of rebellion and darkness and worldliness. So what's the take-home? The take-home isn't find the door. The take-home is, my friend, repent and believe the good news. You can be in today. Repent and believe the good news. Never forget that Simon the sorcerer, who was kind of an antichristic sort of dude, ended up a believer. And lastly, verse 29, and I want to sit on this one for a moment. It contains some extremely important theology. If you know that he, God, is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. I'm going to get a little technical, forgive me, especially at the end of a sermon, because you're all getting ready for a nap. That's okay. Take a couple of breaths, get your oxygen level up. A bit about Greek grammar. And that may seem to be the most boring thing in the universe because I know it was when they first laid it on me. But it's important and I'll show you why. In English, we have three verb tenses, past, present, and future. In Greek, we have six. Those six verb tenses are not chiefly concerned with when the action of the verb took place, but rather what kind of action has taken place. There's a little rule when interpreting Greek verbs. Oh, and if you can join two verbs together to describe a single action, we call that a participle. Okay, participle, two verbs glued together. And it shows an ongoing action. Johnny is running. And in English, they usually end with ing. Participle. Here's the rule. In Greek, in the context of 1 John, when a present tense participle is followed in a sentence by a perfect tense verb, the action of the perfect tense verb causes the action of the present tense participle. Did that completely screw you up? Watch. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness, present tense participle, has been born of him. The has been born of him causes the practices righteousness. Not the other way around. I'll tell you why it's important. If you get that one backwards, that's works doctrine, which is heresy. And that means you don't know Jesus at all. If you believe your righteousness can make you born again, no. In chapter 4, verse 7, we see a nearly identical phrase. Everyone who loves is being born from above. Our love isn't, doesn't cause us to become born of God. We love because we've been born of God. Here's the one that usually messes people up, but it's very important. 
uh, chapter 5, verse 1 of this very same uh, book. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Your believing doesn't cause you to be born of God. Your having been born of God causes you to believe. You didn't make you a Christian, which is why you can't stop you from being a Christian. It's all on the Lord, every single bit of it. Monergism. That's your theological word for the day. So, point being this. The body of Christ is not some willy-nilly club that people can join or not. Do you notice that the sheep is a sheep before Jesus found it? Parable of the 99, left in the fold, the one who's missing goes out until he finds it and brings it home. It was a sheep. He was a sheep even when he was lost. wasn't a goat. If you're in Christ, you were never a goat. You were always a sheep. And because he has joined you to his son, you're safe for all eternity. And we give thanks to him for one another because he has designed the body of Christ for us to live in and be nurtured by and loved on and cared for. This is where we need to be. If anybody tells you you can be a Christian without other Christians, uh, no. You'll be, you'll be done in no time. I'm going to stop now. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we commend your word before you and we thank you for it. And I thank you for the body of Christ represented here and elsewhere. Those who are yours, Father that you would instruct us richly from your word and allow us to deviate neither to the left nor the right. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John 2 My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this, we can be sure that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. If anyone says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone keeps his word, the love of God has been truly perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. Beloved, I am not writing to you a new commandment, but an old one, which you have had from the beginning. This commandment is the message you have heard. Then again, I am also writing to you a new commandment, which is true in him and also in you. For the darkness is fading, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims to be in the light, but hates his brother, he is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother remains in the light, and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, and walks in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven through his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God remains forever. Children, 
It is the last hour, and just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their departure made it clear that none of them belonged to us. You, however, have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I have not written to you because you lack knowledge of the truth, but because you have it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? if it is not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. As for you, let what you have heard from the beginning remain in you. If it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He Himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But just as His true and genuine anointing teaches you about all things, so remain in Him as you have been taught. And now, little children, remain in Christ, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. Open up your heart, he'll come and live in you. And he's looking down. 